Live from the Beaver Street Enterprise Center in Jacksonville, Florida, it's the Parent Town Hall Meetings, presented by the School Choice Advisory Council in conjunction with the Florida Department of Education's Office of Independent Education and Parental Choice. Tonight's discussion, avoid the summer slide, keep them learning through the summer. Welcome, and thank you for your interest in school choice options and possibly serving on a local school choice parent advisory council. I'm Bill Storms, and I'm the chairman of the statewide school choice parent advisory council, and today I will answer a few of your questions. First, I would like to explain the purpose of the local school choice parent advisory council, which is also known as the SCPAC or Choice Council for short. The Council is a Department of Education authorized voluntary organization established to act as a conduit for communication between Florida's parents and the Commissioner of Education, Dr. Eric J. Smith. It exists to provide relevant information and school choice options and how best to communicate that information to parents. The State Level Choice Council was developed and is currently working to organize local school choice parent advisory councils as a critical component in ensuring awareness and participation by reaching parents and the community at the grassroots level. Through a number of parent town hall meetings, the State Choice Council members will share school choice options and many other educational opportunities with parents and assist in fostering relationships between their home, their school, and their community. The statewide school choice parent advisory council is well into its second year of operation and has now completed nine official meetings. The council's mission, all Florida parents will be informed of all educational options and opportunities is quickly, quickly becoming a reality in meetings and back home in the state council members regions new and more effective ways of sharing parent information and concerns on all choice options are being established choice council members are creating a much needed communication link between local school choice stakeholders and the department of education ladies and gentlemen please welcome our featured speakers for the evening Dr. Kathy Sohar and Kevin Crossman from the 21st Century Community Learning Centers at the Florida Department of Education's Bureau of Family and Community Outreach. And tonight we're going to talk about the summer slide. So what is the summer slide? Well, unlike the slide right here, it's not something you slide down in the, in the park in the summer. It's also not the electric slide. Um, the summer slide is also called summer learning loss. And it's basically over the summer, the textbook definition is students lose about a month of academic information when they break for the summer. Studies show that when they give standardized tests, if they give the same test to students when they return to school versus when they took that test at the end, at the end of the school year, the prior year, they're going to lose about four to six weeks or about one month's worth of academic learning. The textbook definition. What I like to say is you're out of practice. Students, during the summer, they're not going to be as focused on studying. They're going to be out playing. So we all know practice makes perfect. So the more you do something, the better you get at it. And if you don't practice something for three months, you're not going to be as good at it as you were when you were practicing. So variables such as grade level and subject matter impact the amount of loss. Um, the, actually, the two main things that, that students lose the most on are uh, math concepts and spelling. So it makes sense because those are the things that you have to practice at and the more you practice, the better you get. If you've ever seen the script spelling bee thing on ESPN where the kids know all these words that you've never even seen before, those kids practice a lot. So if they didn't practice before the bee, they wouldn't really do as well as they do. And then math, you can make, make sense that the, the more you practice math, the better you get at the math multiple choice questions, the better you understand the concepts. So the big thing is that all students over the span of the summer are gonna have some form of academic loss and the teachers are going to spend about four to six weeks reteaching the material that they taught the students the prior year when they get back to school. So what we're going to talk about today is some ways to avoid that. So what can you do to minimize summer learning loss? One interesting thing is that the current academic calendar 
was built around a much different looking family than the way families look today. It was built around the family that farmed, and it was built around communities that didn't have air conditioning. So you needed to break in the summer because you had to plow the fields, you had to pick the crops, whatever it may have been. But then also they didn't want to put students and teachers in buildings where they had no air conditioning. So it wasn't really designed around what the students learn best and how do they learn best. It was designed around a very different time 100 years ago. So just something to consider that even though right now we look very different, why do we not have a year-long calendar? Well, who wants to walk up and tell a kid we're going to take away your summer vacation? That's not necessarily going to be the best topic to introduce. So it is what it is. It's the schedule we have right now. But we're going to teach you some ways to basically minimize the summer learning slide or learning loss. First thing you can do is talk to your kids, your students, teachers. Now, the teachers are going to know the most about what the student ha maybe had trouble with, what is going to be the concept that they learned that year that they're going to have to work on the most in order to perform as well as they did when they come back to school. So they're definitely a good resource, first and foremost, to what you can do over the summer. Second thing is find summer camps in your area. A lot of vendors here today, they're going to go over that with you, so we won't go into too much detail on it. But find something that's going to keep the brain moving over the summer. Look on the internet, look on uh, your local newspapers, talk to the vendors here today. A lot of different resources that you can have to find that. Um, third thing is find after school programs um, in your area. I ac actually represent the 21st Century Community Learning Center, which is a federally funded grant that does not charge anyone, any student, to be able to attend the program. And it runs both during the school year, and then there's also some sites that have after school programs. So if you go to our website, hhp.ufl.edu slash after school, I know it can be difficult to remember that, but if you can write it down. Um, there's actually a map on there that we'll, you can click on that will show every single site that we have, and there's about 350 or so different sites in the state of Florida. So that's a great resource for you, also no charge. Um, now we're going to have Dr. Kathy Sohar come up, and she's going to talk about some things that you can do at home with the kids during, during the summer. Thank you, Kevin. When I go through some of these ideas, I want you to keep one thing in mind, and that is when we talk about learning, and especially learning at home with your families, the idea is to keep it fun. When are you going to learn best is when you're having fun. When, you're, when, when did you learn the most? When you enjoyed something and you were motivated to learn, and you weren't thinking about it as something you had to do. You were thinking, this is really exciting, and this interests me, and I want to learn more about it. So as parents, think about when you were a child. What was it that interested you? Did you, you know, I always use the example of dinosaurs, you know, just because some people, you know, when they're younger, it's like, I want to learn about dinosaurs, and I want to learn everything about that. Whatever that is for you to share with your child, or whatever it is that you see that your child may be interested, try to encourage that. So what we really want to get across today is the idea that every opportunity is an opportunity for learning um, to help your child succeed, to make it not be a chore, um, but to really get those things to be fun and that will inspire them and, and help them succeed as they go along. So really keep that in mind. We're going to throw out some ideas, you know, but that doesn't mean that's what you have to do in that you know, very narrow sense of it. We're just trying to give you some, again, some, some resources to think of, hey, this is how we can, can work this into our daily schedule. And, and you know, it gives you a good opportunity to share that with your, with your family and your child, too. So what we call it, or there's, there's a term for it, not what we call it, but disguised learning. You might hear it called as embedded learning. Um, I'm going to refer to it later at the end of the presentation as the Tom Sawyer method, uh, which I think I made up today. Um, but do you know that story about Tom Sawyer? Does anyone familiar with that story where he has to paint a fence? His, his parents make him paint a fence, and instead of saying, you know, he, instead of looking at it as a chore, he pretends it's really fun, and by the end of the day, everyone's joining him, and everyone wants to paint the fence. So it's that idea: is if you have it look fun, then that's going to get, you know, or if you really do think it's fun, it's going to get everybody excited. So. One area um, you can just do even simple concepts is like when you're shopping. You can get your child, help your child write out the grocery list for you. So again, we're learning things like reading and fluency and spelling. Um, so you know, have them just, and it's part, hey, what do we need? Let's make a list. Let's write it down. Um, at the grocery store, have them as you're going through. It's like, hey, you know, here's our budget. Let's see where we are. You know, how much more do we have to go? So they can be adding it up as they go along, either you know, by hand, by a calculator in their head. You know, if you have, you know, if you have a couple of kids, you can do contests. You can see, okay, what's, what's the tally? Where are we now? Uh, you know, if, if our budget is $50 and we're at $32.96, 
You know, how much money do we have left to spend? How much can we buy? So, you know, just things like that, kind of keep it fun. Um, they can calculate the tax before the register does. You know, just, again, that's math. If you're watching sports, um, and a lot of people, a lot of kids are interested in sports, whatever the sport is, you can use those statistics, you can make, you know, make up games to play, so you can incorporate that. Um, and that can be if you're watching on TV, if you are going to your, you know, local Little League game, whatever it is. So, you know, even just, just say, hey, how many baskets would I need? And, you know, if I had this many three-point shots, this many two-point shots, you know, work it out. So, um, you can just do it a lot of different ways. When you're driving, you know, even, hey, how many, if gas costs this, how many miles can we go if we have 20, you know, gallons? So, it's just kind of doing math, but turning it around a little bit. You know, in the kitchen, the kitchen's a great opportunity to learn and when you think about, um, you know, again, we're talking about things like reading. Have the children read the recipes out loud. Um, on the internet now, you know, if you have access to the internet at home, you can look up, there's so many recipe uh, resources online, like recipes.com, you know, they can help search recipes and put different things in, but really reading the recipes out loud, you know, certainly doing the measurements is a great way to learn fractions. You know, we need a cup and a quarter. You know, what does that mean? And just, just helping them understand that. And it's a great lesson for them, too, just to learn about how to actually cook. Um, you know, what's healthy. And let's, let's look some stuff up online. Has anyone been watching the Jamie Oliver Food Revolution on TV? It's a TV show. Um, it's about this man who's um, uh, a chef who's come into the schools and he's trying to get the schools to, to, you know, to have healthier food. So even, I mean, you can watch a TV program and, have, and talk about it with your kids and have it even be educational. You know, there's, there's no, nothing, nothing to say. TV can't be educational, too. If you're talking about food, you can you know, have the kids do some research on you know, history of the food, the geographic region. So again, it's, just, it's, it's really kind of the sky's the limit. Like, be creative. Um, you know, so some other ideas. Um, you know, day trips. And again, these can be, you know, it doesn't have to even be spending your money. And especially in the summer, there's so much going on in Florida. If you look in the papers, that's, um, you know, free, like free outdoor concerts or, um, you know, gardens or, you know, museums. Um, I know in, in my neighborhood, there's a museum that one night a week has, you know, free family night. Um, and sometimes they show movies or, you know, whatever it is. And ask your kids too, like, hey, you know, what, what, what would you like to do? And you can have them look in the paper for, let's see, can we find some stuff to do? So again, that gets them searching through the paper and, and looking for information and then, um, you know, have them be a part of that too. So, and when you do do these trips, have them write about it afterwards. And again, writing doesn't have to be a report. And it doesn't have to be like, you know, graded. It can just be the process of writing it out. They can keep a journal of things they do over the summer. They can write a letter to someone in your family, like their grandparent, their aunt and uncle, or a friend. Um, you know, just even just talking about it. What did you think about when we went there? Um, what did you like? What didn't you like? Just, just kind of getting that, you know, interactive talk with them. You know, everyone says it's important to talk to your kids, but have them think about what they saw. Um, you know, and certainly drawing pictures. Whatever it is, you know, it really is, even if you just go to a local park and you walk around and you look at different plants and you look them up, you know, later. So, um, movies, you know, there's, there's certainly a, a really lot of um, opportunity to learn through movies. I'm a big fan of this. Um, the examples I've given, again, we're, we'll talk a bit more about you want to keep it age appropriate. These are probably some movies for some older, you know, maybe middle school or high school kids. But King Corn, you may never have heard of. It's going to sound maybe boring. It's a documentary about the corn industry. And it sounds boring. And when I heard about it, I said, oh my god, I did, that sounds so boring. But it actually is pretty interesting. And they take, you know how they mass produce corn now and corn syrups and everything? Well, these two filmmakers went to Iowa and they looked at an acre of land and they followed, they planted an acre of corn and they followed it the whole way to production. Now, I'm not selling it very well, but it really is. I learned so much and it was really interesting and, and it's in everything. If you pick up, uh, you know, pretty much any 
you know, or most, you know, products in the supermarket, it's what's the first ingredient? Corn syrup. And they just go through this whole process. So just that alone is a really interesting, um, you know, movie that can kind of get you, you know, informed and talking about things. Um, and what's great is now a lot of libraries, if you're, if you're not, if you're not, a, you're not a member, if you don't have your library card or your local library, um, you know, I encourage you to do that. Um, you know, libraries now have DVDs, um, VC, uh, you know, videotapes for free so many times um, that you can take out and rent for, you know, a week at a time for free, um, or even go and watch them there sometimes. So, you know, it's not, again, it's not even uh, that you have to go out and rent a movie. So, you know, whatever the movie is it's, that's of interest in you, even if it's not a straight doc, it doesn't have to be a documentary, but something, you know, about history, whatever interests you, flying, airplane, just to have, again, that interaction with your children, talk to them about it, and again, it's, if, it ha if it's an opportunity for them to go and then do a little bit more research, you know, all the better, and encourage them to do that. You never know what's going to get them interested in something. You know, maybe they watch a movie about, you know, uh, the horse sea biscuits. I love that movie, but it's it's a story about a horse, and he really existed, and um, he you know won all these races, and, and it's a you know fun movie to watch. But you you know it is real history, and you can learn about the depression through it, and you can talk about all the stuff. So games are great. Um, games like Boggle, Scrabble, Yahtzee can work on you know spelling and math, um, and a lot of people don't think about that as helping children to learn card games, you know, just even simple games of, you know, maybe gin rummy where you're actually having to count and they teach real skills like how to, um, you know, to, to analyze and, and be a risk taker. Um, there's a lot of, I won't bore you with all the research on it, but, uh, you know, the idea of kids who play games really learn these important skills about mastering skills and taking risks um, in a safe environment and it really helps them uh, you know, be more social and all of, you know, really very important concepts that will help them academically and educationally. So don't just count the importance of games. And again, I can't stress enough just the value of sitting with your children and playing those games. So, um, you know, really, and again, whatever game you enjoy, chess, check, or whatever it is, um, you know, and go to yard sales, get some games if you don't have them, you can pick them up. Um, get them, let's see, reading. Um, you know, certainly encouraging your child to read as much as possible. But again, don't turn it into work. Don't turn it into a chore. Reading can be fun. I know it's a cliche, but um, it doesn't mean you have to read. You know, certainly there are reading lists. As Kevin was saying, you want to talk to your child's teachers, maybe see what they should be reading for next year and what they should work on. But I'm a big advocate of if they're reading a comic book, that's okay too, maybe, especially if they're a struggling reader. You know, just getting them to read. Read magazines. You know, if you get the newspaper, read the newspaper together, and, and that's a good opportunity to talk about current events and, hey, you know, uh, you know really just opportunity to, to get that dialogue going. Magazines, you know, cereal boxes. Hey, let's look at the recipes in this. What ingredients are in this? Um, but really, anything. When you're in the car, reading billboards, playing those games, like let's play the ABC game, I see A, B, C, it's really everywhere you go. Um, and I was talking to someone earlier about, you know, just, you know, when your kids are acting up sometimes too, if you keep them involved, they're going to act up a lot less, you know, when they're on a trip or, you know, if in the car or in the bus or something, if they have a book with them or if you're playing the reading game, you know, like let's look at the license plates, that's going to keep them engaged too, so that's, you know, a little more incentive. Um, but we'll go through each of these, uh, four points here, the idea of being a reading role model, reading with your child, you know, what, how to choose an appropriate uh, material to read, and then, you know, we, I provided an online source as well. We talk about reading role model again, I talked about going to the library, go to a library, the library with your child and walk through the aisles with him or her and, and say, you know, really look at the books and, and even if you don't end up taking books out or they don't find anything, you know, just encourage them to browse, you know, get them to kind of really appreciate books and what this is and, you know, what kind of strikes their attention, not this is what you have to read. Because sometimes, you know, there are a lot of restrictions of they have to read all this stuff in school. Let them find something that really interests them and read that. Um, let them, of course, you know, it's great if they can see you read and, you know, you enjoying it. Um, and I think I already talked about 
don't limit it to just you know school books. It really can it really can take place everywhere. So um, it's great you know if you can read with your child, um, and especially if they're ha if they're a struggling reader, it's real important to be patient and to be encouraging because um, that can be. Uh, you know, very, di very difficult if they're having trouble. So it may really take some patience on, on, on a parent part, but it's important. So again, um, you know, I think it's great too. Like, if they're having those troubles, or even if they're not, act out the scenes. And especially, you know, some kids really, you know, are, 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 uh, are, are characters and actors, so encourage them to really go with it and say, let's, a let's act this out. Because if you repeat, if they're ha having trouble reading, Sometimes if they read the same books over and over, that's a very good way to help them be stronger readers as well. Um, there's a, an important concept of fluency. You've probably heard that word. Um, and what it really means is if you're a struggling reader and you, you're just trying to sound out every word, um, you're not going to be understanding what you're reading as much as trying to get through that. So the more comfortable they get learning these words and reading them maybe you know a few times and over and over, They'll get more, more fluent, more confident. Um, I mean, and we work in after school programming, and one of my favorite activities for reading fluency is karaoke. And you wouldn't think, you know, karaoke, that's not reading fluency. Well, if you're reading across the screen, it is. And I guarantee you, there's very few kids that are thinking, here's my reading fluency lesson. No, they're thinking, I'm going to be on American Idol. So that can be very effective. And that's a good way, too, if you have the TV closed captioning. If you ever heard that as a tip, like just, you know, you turn on that closed caption and it screens across. You know, you're watching TV, but guess what? You're reading, too. So that's, you know, that's a really nice way to cheat it. Um, in terms of picking something that's the correct level for reading, something called the five finger rule. And it basically says, take a book, you know, open it up. And if your child reads and they don't understand more than five words, that might be a little too advanced for them, that book. So they may want to choose something else. Um, so that's one way to do it. Um, this is an online resource that I got a lot of these tips from when I was doing putting this presentation together that I thought was great. And it's specifically set up for parents. Well, there's a section for teachers and a section for parents. and. Um, so that's the link right there. Um, readingrockets.org is the main site. But I thought they had some great tips. So um, if you want to do some more research on your own, so want, you can go to Reading Rockets. And um, this may not seem directly related to how to keep your child learning over the summer, but it really is. Keep them physically fit for so many different reasons, not just because it improves their health, but because it improves their attention and motivation. And you know, it's that old, the old adage of you know, healthy body, healthy mind. Um, and summer's a great time. Of course, you know, they want to be running around and burn all that out. So you know, keep them going. And again, the more you can do that with them, the better. Build that relationship. So if they do have things you know, that they want to talk to you about, it makes it a little bit easier. You, know, you can go swimming, take bike rides, even you know, working outside. Again, it's not limited to just this is a traditional exercise. It's, hey, if we're just walking around the neighborhood, um, you know, if a neighbor's dog needs a, you know, if you have an elderly neighbor, maybe their dog needs to be walked. You know, encourage your child, hey, maybe you can take the dog for a walk, or whatever it is. Um, you know, just kind of keep fit. It definitely, uh, you know, it's a good idea, certainly. And let me see. Um, so basically, to kind of go over some of the things, uh, we were just talking about, um, you know, just be involved. Really, you'll see the opportunity. Uh, as you look around, hopefully, more and more now, um, not that you didn't anyway, but to incorporate that learning into a more everyday life. Um, I really think that there's, you know, very few places, if anywhere, where you can't take that opportunity and turn it into, you know, a learning opportunity. So. You know that's 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 a great way to do it. Um, like I said, the using just everyday opportunities to teach um, that embedded disguised learning. Okay, really working on the core concepts: math, reading, and writing. Um, and writing is one of the easiest things I think to incorporate because there's nothing you can't write about. 
<laughs> they can just write about their day. They can write, and, and if, they're, if something happens, if they're mad, if they're happy, tell them to write about it, you know, encourage them. Let's, let's talk about it, let's write about it. Let's make a story about it. Um, and really encourage them to use their imagination, so. Um, and again, I really encourage you to, as much as you can, focus that around activities that are meaningful to your child. So ask them what they're interested in, and then try and, and, and strategize and, and plan things around that. Or things that you're interested in as well, you know, is gonna, you're going to translate that excitement to them. So you know, those are all good. Um, again, age appropriate. Um, you know, your six-year-old is certainly going to have different abilities and interests than your you know, 12 or 15-year-old. So um, we want to challenge them at an appropriate level. We don't want to give them things that are too hard so they get frustrated. Um, and, but we don't want to make it too easy that they're, they're not you know, gaining anything from it. So um, age appropriate. And then lastly, like I said, when I've kind of been the focus of what I've been talking about, this, this embedded learning, the Tom Sawyer method, um, just, just make it fun. If you look, kids want to spend time with you, and of course, you guys want to be the best parents you can be. You're all here. It's, it's, it's great. I mean, you're already, um, you know, preaching to the choir. So, um, but that's that's a great way to do it. Is just let's let's have fun. They want to spend time with you, and you know, just just bring it in and and ask them. I think they'll have a lot of good ideas to share. So, I think that's it. I know that we uh, are going to have a question and answer period later for the people here in this room and uh, I think at the other sites as well. So we want to thank you very much for having us here today to share these ideas with you. And I uh, you know, look forward to uh, you all sharing these ideas with your, your family and your community. Thank you.